Now, Simon, let me ask you a question because you're a clinical neuropsychologist. You deal with patients. Right. Uh, what are some of the common problems that people come to you with? Well, I think virtually everybody comes in saying that they have an attention or a memory problem. And for me, as a clinician, the main issue is to you know, confirm or disconfirm their concerns. And it's not that easy many times to know um, from just meeting the person. I think that's where diagnosis is very important in my line of work because many people can come in and they have a lot of concerns, but then some may be unwarranted in the sense that they're not diagnosed with any particular disorder. And then you have somebody else who comes in and they have minimal concerns, yet they show little insight into the difficulties that uh, he or she has in everyday life. But if they're coming to see you, they must have a symptom of some kind that they're concerned about. Well, it would be something that either he or she is concerned about or the family member is concerned about. So the main issue for me is who is coming in. Is it the patient who is having the complaint or is it the family member who is voicing the complaint? And that question actually tells me a lot about uh, what kind of diagnosis I'm looking at. Now, do you often diagnose things as a physical problem with the brain? There's something physically wrong with the brain, or is it often more of a thought problem? The person is just not thinking right. They're not framing their life in the right framework. They're not keeping things in the proper proportions. For me, it's probably the latter, because I see it from a more functional perspective. It's really their cognition and their emotions. And it's interesting because many patients think, well, if I have problems, they should manifest itself on a brain imaging scan so that there should be a strong correlation between what you see on a photograph and what you see in real life. But the truth is that many times there are discrepancies so that many patients who I see, their brain scans are totally clean. Yet when you ask them how their life is, they say, well, I'm forgetting everything. I can't manage my bills, I can't take my medicines on time. And it's all true because it's validated and corroborated by family members. So from a clinical standpoint, it's very interesting to see the discrepancy between a physical, uh, you know, issues physically and issues from other perspectives. Now, if it's not a physical problem, is there still something you can do to treat it? It's, it's still a problem. It's still a problem, and many times it's really what gets manifested first. So I do see many people with neurological disorders like Alzheimer's, but other types of dementias. And it's very difficult to sort of generalize and say everybody comes in with this profile. Some people may come in with a memory concern, but then later they develop a physical problem. Another person comes in with problems walking, and then two years later, they develop a memory problem. They may, both individuals may have the same diagnosis, but their developmental course is drastically different. And as a clinician, the ideal, you know, the purpose is to say, well, you know, these presentations look very different, but they're actually looking at the same diagnostic entity. Yeah. Now, there are certain, you know, mental problems that are fairly common. For example, many people are troubled by disturbing thoughts that they don't want to have in their head, but they can't seem to get rid of them. Uh, would that typically be a physical brain problem or, or something else, some kind of thinking problem? And is there anything that can be done for that? Well, I think there are definitely uh, issues related to brain circuitry that could account for somebody, uh, you know, maybe getting stuck in a certain kind of thought or a certain type of uh, behavior or some sort of maladaptive pattern. And there are many types of therapies that say, well, you know, condition you to um, do a certain type of intervention. So like in behavioral therapy, they say, well, if you have a negative thought, sometimes um, say stop or, you know, use a rubber band against your wrist and then hit it to sort of get you back into the right frame of mind. Um, but I think um, maladaptive thoughts, it's really sort of, to address them, you have to sort of I think on some level you have to unlearn what is negative and then learn something that is uh, positive or adaptive. And Marty, that learning, that unlearning actually requires the brain to be changed physically. 
you know, when you look at the performance of any brain and you see that the performance is distorted or limited in some way, that is sine qua non evidence that the brain, in fact, is physically distorted in, to, to some extent. And when you look at specific populations in umpty -umpt, there are thousands of studies like this. And look at within the specific dimensions that describe the condition that the person has, you see those distortions expressed in their circuitry. So the brain in a, in a general scan may look very normal, but in detail the brain is functionally distorted by, in its connectivity and its wiring. So you can see something as small as individual neurons and axons firing and say that one looks like it's firing wrong? Well, commonly we look at, and there are many instances in which that's been studied, but primarily not so much in human models because it's difficult to record on that level from the human brain. Mm -hmm. But we certainly do see gross differences in the basic strengths of wiring patterns and the patterns of connectivity in brains that distinguish one neuropathological condition from another. Well, do you think that people are capable, at least theoretically, of programming their minds, of choosing their attitude and their outlook and setting their minds instead of saying, well, I'm, I just passively become whatever the world buffets me into becoming? Well, yeah. <laughs> well the brain is plastic, Marty, and, and actually it's under our control. And we have the capacity to change it. Now, it, it's not always easy for the average citizen to understand what they would need to do to drive change. And, and psych, psychologists, therapists have devised strategies. Basically, their strategies are effective because they engage the person in ways that can drive change. We're just beginning to learn, in a sense, how to control the genie. And that's now where a large part of the research in this practical scientific area has been directed. We're understanding increasingly when we see a brain that has a particular pattern of distortion, how to drive it correctly in ways that, that advantage and correct it. Do you think we might someday get to the point with enough understanding that there will no longer be such a thing as a neurosis or a psychosis? Is that theoretically we might, we might possible? Be. I mean, I think we're, it, theoretically it's possible. I think we're kind of far away from that. And, uh, I don't think we're so far. You know, we're, we're, we're now running an FDA trial. We're in the midst of an FDA trial, the research group that I'm working with, on the treatment of schizophrenia. We can have very large impacts on the expressions of schizophrenia in an active schizophrenic patient. And we've looked in a number of ways in the brains of these patients, and we see the brain of the schizophrenic patient with training, particular forms of training, of course, looks substantially normalized in the areas that we're targeting. Now, we're not, we're, we haven't trained completely enough to drive the brain and so that we can say that we can reliably, quote, cure the condition. But I absolutely think that that is in the realm of possibility, that we'll see that probably, if not in our lifetime, not too far into the future. Now, is schizophrenia basically a matter of, you know, multiple personalities? Each one doesn't know what the other one is doing at any given time? I think in the past, I mean, I remembered uh, supervisors of mine who thought schizophrenia was a personality disorder and it, which it was willful. And, but I think sort of the more, uh, you know, the latest notion is that it's a biological disorder, but it also has, you know, environmental underpinnings. And so there, it's multifactorial. And schizophrenia, I think, is a very complex disorder to study. But then I think many neurological disorders are in that category as well. There's a lot to train, but let me just, just, just point out another prospect about even something as complicated as schizophrenia. If you have schizophrenia and you have an identical twin, there's a less than even chance the identical twin will develop the disease, which means that there are factors in life and environments that contribute to onset. And the simple fact is, is that it's treating schizophrenia is incredibly complex because with our sort of strategy, because there's a lot to fix, there's a lot to change. The brain is massively distorted. But on the other hand, preventing its onset, increasing resilience in an at-risk individual, doing enough in the environmental interaction of that individual in their brain to change it enough to make it more resilient against the onset. Now that's much more practical. And I absolutely believe that is something we will see in the next decade. We will see strategies, we are, are already seeing strategies by which we know we can delay and probably prevent the onset of schizophrenia in many individuals that would succumb to it. Now one of the most promising methods, is it uh, pharmaceutical drugs or talk therapy where they talk it out until they get some insight on their own. What, what's the most promising uh, approach right now? I'm, I'm not sure if there's any single one approach. And I think there are many out there. 
um, in types of disorders that I see, I don't think necessarily talk therapy would be very helpful for somebody with Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. Um, I think a lot of the literature has talked about um, physical interventions, so aerobic exercise, but getting your body to move. Um, there's a lot of you know, information about somebody with Parkinson's disease that you know, dance therapy or other types of movements can really help the person. And I think that's something that many people are looking into. And I think it's really a complement to what's existing in terms of you know, the cognitive tree training. I think you know, it's something that warrants further investigation. I think there's tremendous hope there. And I think that in, in these therapeutic strategies, I think, that in fact, there's a kind of revolution that's beginning to occur in which we're understanding how to drive the brain correctively as a, in, in, in so far as it's distorted in a variety of neurological and psychiatric conditions, and that it will be largely marshalling brain plasticity. When you think about something like dance therapy or movement therapy, remember there's a brain involved, and you're actually driving changes in the brain that are strengthening it, that are, that are increasing its, its, uh, its operational capacities, conceivably increasing resilience. So we're understanding increasingly how to control these to make a brain that is weak that is in danger, put it back in a stronger and safer position. I think the one thing to um, remember, and I think it comes from what you asked about, the difference between the mind and the brain. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, and from my point of view, I think the brain, I think of it as much more, you know, sort of an organism. But the mind, and, and this was touched upon, I think, earlier, but, you know, the mind is more individualistic. And I think, uh, you know, it's very difficult to sort of generalize to you know, all minds because each mind is different. And I think that's why uh, to have one you know, intervention that will capture everybody, I personally don't think it's really possible. Uh, well, let me ask you this. What do you think are some of the upper potentials of the mind? We've been talking about impairments and how to solve them, but do we have mental abilities that we're scarcely aware of?